business panel. Thank you. These lights are bright. This is intimidating. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Midshipman Second Class Richard Poise, and I'm really excited to be moderating this panel today, where we'll be featuring three leaders who have taken their leadership experiences in military service and putting them to use in the business sector. First up, we have Chris Sandbar, who is a 1995 graduate of the United States Naval Academy and currently serves as an executive vice president at AT&T Network leading teams responsible for designing, engineering, building, and operating AT&T's next generation mobile and fiber networks. He also serves on the board for the National Medal of Honor Museum Foundation. Then we have... <laughs> you gotta wait to see what I say and decide if you wanna clap later. <laughs> then we have Lieutenant Colonel Fay, class of 2003, who began his career in the Marine Corps for 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, and completed one six-month tour to Fallujah, Iraq in 2005. In his civilian career, Lieutenant Colonel Fay launched his own company and is the founding member and president of Quattrofoil Consulting, LLC. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, we have Caitlin Hardy, class of 2010, is the Vice President of Programs, Americas for Kongsberg Maritime, and Head of Kongsberg Underwater Technology, LLC. She leads Kongsberg Maritime's Program Management Organization in the Americas, and currently sits on the Board of Directors for WISTA USA and the Woman Offshore Advisory Board. Welcome, ma'am. So this first question is for no one in particular, so please feel free to jump in whenever. But um, what was your driving force behind making the transition to your, the private sector? I'll, I'll start, I guess. Um, my drive, the driving force for me was my, my first daughter, right? So a lot of events happen in your life, whether you know, it's military events or, or personal life events. but. You know, when, when you have that first kid and you, you've been married for a few years and you really spent maybe 50% of that time with your wife between prepping for deployments or deploying or training, um, you know, that was, that was the point where my wife said, hey, you know, we're, we have a kid now. Why don't we do, why don't we transition out? We cut a deal. I said, look, I'm willing to go into the civilian sector, but you got to let me stay a reservist so that I can still... Um, have my weekends fueled by testosterone, and um, she's, she agreed to that, and, and I've been doing that ever since. But I would say that the, the big life change for me was having my first kid um, and wanting to make sure that um, I was able to balance the time as a father with, with continuing a military career. Mine was similar. I was, uh, I was a SEAL, and the divorce rate in the SEALs was like 80%, probably still is. I think it got a little higher after the war started. Um, and uh, I was getting married. Also, they had made some changes to the way the teams were structured and how the deployments were, which I didn't love. And so I just wanted to try something new. I loved the military. And when I tell you, when I was in your seat, I, I didn't know whether I was going to make a career of the Navy or whether I was going to get out and go into the civilian world. I had no idea. So, uh, But that was my decision at the time. Funny enough, my um, my friend over here, Jeff Webb, we were classmates, and we were in the same platoon. We deployed together, and uh, we both got out after that deployment. And we told our XO that we were getting out right before we went on deployment because they need time to plan to replace us when we get back. So we were doing the right thing and giving them time to replace us, and that conversation didn't go very well with our XO, as you'd imagine. He was pretty upset, had some choice words for both of us, tried to replace both of us, fire us from the Navy. But anyways, we ended up doing a deployment together and it went great. But it's a really tough decision when you get there. And the truth is, you leave and then it's hard to really leave. Yeah. Uh, I left in 2000 and then uh, was out, had a wife, two kids, and then the war started. And I uh, told my wife, I think I need to get back in the Navy, in the reserves. And she said, <laughs> She said a war just started. Did you know that? 
And I said, yeah, that's why I'm getting back in. I mean, that's what we do. We're here to train to go fight, so I'm going to go fight. Hurrah. Yeah. So <laughs> I, ended up getting, I ended up getting back in, and I was over in Iraq at the same time you were, as a matter of fact. How about that? Don't worry, ma'am. I'm also feeling a little bit of imposter syndrome sitting in this chair. <laughs> You're doing a good job. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so our next question is, what were you seeking in your post-active duty employment? Mm. Tough choice. You made the decision to get out. What yeah. are you looking for? Well, that's a tough one, so I'd be lying if I didn't say I was looking for more money. Let's just be honest. But that wasn't the main driving factor. I just wanted to do something different. And uh, I have learned over the years that I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty impatient. I like to always be learning something new, doing, doing something different, something new and exciting. And so I got into the civilian world, and sure enough, I've had probably in 20, 21 years, I've been at AT&T. And, uh, and I've had uh, probably a dozen jobs, and I've moved seven times. And uh, so I like, I like change, excitement, you know, learning something new. Um, Money's good, but in the end, that's not everything. There's things that are a lot more important in this world than money. Uh, so with respect to what I was looking for, I had no idea. I'll be honest, and I feel like you know, one point for the young folks out here that are just starting your military career, when you decide to transition, put a plan together, okay? Because I did not have one. It mm -hmm. was 2009, and you guys were in diapers, but um, that was not a great time to be looking for a job, even if you were a, a combat veteran or, or a military or a Naval Academy grad. That was great. I will say this, though, that Naval Academy alumni network, it comes through. Um, and I got my first start with you know, a guy named Steve Cantrell and a guy named John Marinucci, two, two Naval Academy grads that were already out in the business world doing great things, found me, scooped me up, dusted me off, gave me a job, not paying me more than what I was getting paid as a Marine. But, um, but it led to great things, and it led to where I was. So uh, my answer to your question is I didn't know what I was looking for. I found it with the help of some mentors, um, and I suggest to anyone that is thinking about transitioning or when your time comes to make sure you do think about that in advance and have a plan. Is this working? Yeah. So for me, because I was a little bit of a different case, you know, I've had a lot of friends that are still serving and we have a conversation around transitioning out of the military all the time. And maybe it's just jet lag, so traveling in uh, Oslo for work last week. But I think a lot about the military and transitioning as sort of a train. And so, so often we're kind of sold this story of there's one train, it's a straight line. If you follow it, good things will happen. You don't have to think about a lot to facilitate where you end up, whether that's at five years or 10 or 15 or 20. But when in reality, there's not really a wrong choice you can make. And if any of you are like me, which I suspect we're all at this institution, or most of us are, a very type A personality and almost a zero-sum mindset of, this has to be the single best possible answer. It is OK to get out and maybe not pick the perfect place for you, because you reserve the right to always change, right? You find the mission that you identify with most. most. And I think for me, that was the most important thing when I was getting out. Because I really did care about serving. You know, in the last session, we were talking about what's your purpose. And I think for me, I really identified with a purpose of how do I make people safer? How do I make people safer at sea? How do I make sure that we're preserving the environment? 
And so within each of the companies that I've been to over the last 13 years, I used to be embarrassed to say like, oh, I changed jobs six months ago. I changed jobs two years ago. But for me, especially being on the younger side compared to some of my colleagues, that was a way to level up my skills and professionalize. That was far quicker than what any of those individual organizations might have given me otherwise. I'm going to add a quick note to what you said about serving too. So service is obviously what you're all, the midshipmen in here, are getting into. Um, you're, you're going to go serve and you have a desire to serve and that's awesome. Um, and that's going to get you very far because that's a difference maker between you and a lot of the civilian world. And I'll say this, career changes and even when I transitioned out, how did I run into those guys? I volunteered to be part of the Travis Mania Foundation, ran into them there. How did I get my first client? I was volunteering uh, at the Medal of Honor Grove at the Freedoms Foundation, and I met my first client as, as a business owner. You know, that desire to serve, don't ever get rid of it, keep it, because those little volunteer opportunities and you serving your community, they will lead to, to things in the civilian sector um, that sort of make up for the fact that you kind of feel like you're not serving your country anymore in uniform. You'll always have it in your blood, right? Yeah. You always want to serve. How many of you have given thought to what you're going to do after the military? Which, would, which is kind of odd, except that, you, like she said, you're all type A personalities, so you <laughs> want to have a plan from now until you're 99 years old. That's how I was. But don't, how many of you have figured out what you're going to do after the military? Okay, good. That's a lot less hands. Oh, there's one back there. I'm interested, but I figured won't ask. It out. Yeah, he's figured it out. That's good. So I was like you. I used to think about what I'm going to do after the military, not because I was ready to get out, but I just kind of type A. I want to have a plan. Um, to put your mind at ease, the day I got out, I still had no idea what I wanted to do. So I went to business school. That was a good idea, because then I got two more years of stalling to figure out what I wanted to do. And then three months before graduation from business school, guess what? Still had no idea what I wanted to do. And I was at an information session for the phone company with Pacific Bell. AT&T ended up buying them. And there was a Marine there. He would gotten out a year before. And I ended up talking to him. And he says, dude, you should come work at AT&T. It's a good company. I'm like, OK. So I did that. Now, it's been 21 years, and I'm still there. But that's kind of how it worked out. So don't get nervous if you're not sure what you want to do and you haven't figured out your life. And I'm 49, and I still haven't figured out what I'm going to do next year. So. Wait, sir, a Marine hired a SEAL? <laughs> Department of the Navy. Department of the Navy. Let's keep going. Um, yeah. <laughs> Colonel Fay, I'd love to hear from you first, if you don't mind. What lessons have you implemented into your company that you learned from your military service? Um, that's an easy one for me. My entire company, the, the Quatreville Consulting, was completely based on the military planning process. So one thing that the military is really good at it, and I'll give them a lot of credit for this, especially the Marine Corps. You know, there used to be those commercials, there's an app for that, there's an app for that. In the Marine Corps, there's a pub for that, right? There's a publication for that. If you don't know what you're doing, there's a pub for that. If you want to put a machine gun together, figure out how to do fields of fire, you want to figure out how to set up a defense, go get the pub, read it, follow the instructions. Same thing goes for planning. So the Marine Corps planning process was something that I was really enamored with. I thought it was a really great process. I loved how you did war gaming and came up with COAs and then decided on your solution. You, at the end of the day, you had to be decisive, pick one and run with it. Um, and then obviously call kinds of audibles uh, when things go wrong. But that planning process was something I felt like the construction industry that I was in could really use, especially owners, you know, people that were doing big things with big money. And they were like, oh, do we lease the land? Do we buy the land? Do we do an old building and renovate it? Or we use a green space? You know, those are COAs. And so basically what we did was we took that Marine Corps philosophy of, hey, do a publication, follow the doctrine, and, and use the planning process that's laid out to, um, you know, civilianize that and turn that into a consulting business. And, and it really worked well. And, and I think that's a testament to the military. You know, we are not always going to be here. You know, leaders get killed in the, in the field of battle. Um, admirals retire, you know, so you have to be able to pick up that doctrine and that, and that process and, and you're going to have an opportunity to make it better, and all of you probably will, but those processes exist, and, and they're pretty good, and I would say that's probably the best thing I took out of, the, out of my time in the military and used it in, the, in my civilian career. So. 
I think for us, so I work for a company called Kongsberg Maritime. We're a Norwegian company of roughly 12,000 people. So, you know, small compared to an AT&T, but certainly large. And my team focuses almost entirely on defense these days, um, largely focused in the Americas. And so for us, I think a lot about being an OEM, an original equipment manufacturer, it's really important that we deliver a product that someone is buying in the way they expect it to work. But even more important, and I would say the military piece that comes in, is you have technical execution, and that's key. But you really need operational execution. What does it mean for that operator when they're in the field? And so for our team, I have a lot of pressures to ensure that we're delivering as the customer expects and almost that hand-holding along the way to show them that when they're running their missions, you know, this is the backbone they need to ensure that they can be successful. Um, a, a quick story on, on sort of the opposite side of where I'm at Kongsberg, but when I went back to grad school, I'm originally from the PAC Northwest, from the Seattle area, and I remember my first night, I did an evening MBA walking on campus, and I was like, oh my god, people are walking on the grass, like, not allowed. And then the next thing, I like, feel the tension in my chest, the next thing I see is, like, someone walking on a tightrope between trees, like, mind totally blown. Um, there's a lot I remember from that first night, but what they told us was, you know, you'll change roles while you're in this program at least three times. And I was like... I'm not changing three times, like you're crazy. And I changed programs three times. And I think one of the things that you learn in the military that I forget sometimes because it's almost innate how I've applied it is the flexibility to meet the mission that you're given or to being open to the things that you weren't necessarily expecting. And it's how you react in those moments I think really show who you are. And so, you know, when there's those just arbitrary, I have no idea what's going on or how could a lesson apply here, like rely on your training and your background from where you are today because you'll be amazed at how much it serves you. And when you combine that with something like positive intent, right, like, oh, I don't know where they're coming from, but people usually are coming from a good place. And when you combine those, that's a really powerful arrow. I think the answer for me was leadership, similar. Um, so quick story, when I was I was about a year into my civilian job, and I had this um, team of salespeople, and uh, I, you know I didn't know anything about sales. Um, and it was Monday morning at the team meeting, and when I went into the business world, I figured, well, I probably need to change my leadership style. I need to be a business professional. This is a different leadership style, because when you're a business professional, you've got to wear a suit and tie every day, and you've got to be very poised got to you know have really nice clothes expensive clothes and you got to keep your personal and professional lives separate and you don't talk to your employees about their personal lives that needs to stay separate and does this is making sense I know it's not so but I was an idiot so it made sense to me back then so that's how I was and so it's Monday morning at this meeting with my team who I had had for about four or five months and they were all talking before the meeting about what they had done the previous weekend a couple days before they had done this and that, and it was a lot of fun. And one of them turns to me and says, and I didn't ever talk about what I did in my personal life. They turned to me and they said, what did you do over the weekend, Chris? And I said, normally I wouldn't say anything. I just said I had a nice time with my wife. Um, but in this case, I had had two Navy buddies who had come into town, and we went out to the bars in Pasadena, and we got pretty, you know. <laughs> and the two of them, my wife and I, we had a good time. We were singing karaoke. It was a late night. It was fun. You know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? Of course, yeah. <laughs> I can pretend. Yeah, bitching. It was awesome. So, <laughs> so I'm like, well, I actually had a good weekend. Two friends came in town, went out to Pasadena, and they said, wait, you drink? And I was like, I'm thinking to myself, I was in the Navy. I was a SEAL. I have a PhD in drinking. Are you kidding? <laughs> but I didn't say that. I just said, yes. And they said, wow, we, we assumed you, like, studied all weekend. Or <laughs> so they thought I was a robot, basically. And so I did a lot of reflection after that. And I said, this whole business professional thing, that's wrong. Um, what did I learn growing up in the military at the Naval Academy, being a naval officer with a platoon of folks, you know, multiple platoons? What did I learn? I learned um, servant leadership, care about your people, take care of your people, ask them how their family's doing. Um, when your buddy's crying and, um, because he misses his kids on deployment, you know, he's a tough SEAL sniper, but you still give him a hug and say, dude, it'll be okay. We'll be home in three months. You'll get to see your kid who was just born. Um, you're humble, the quiet professional. And I went back to that leadership style, and I learned um, that's what resonates. And in the end, what you guys don't realize yet is um, people are watching you, and they always will be because of who you are and where you come from. Whether it's the Naval Academy, whatever institutions you come from, 
if you're one of the elite in America, which you are, it's taking me years to figure out that people are watching me because it just feels weird, but they are. I have 30,000 people in my organization and they watch me. And that's hard for me, but um, I have to be careful and I have to be professional for them, but I have to show them that caring and loving people, that's important. And so bringing that into the workforce and showing people that are looking up to you um, how to be a great leader, that's something you'll have the rest of your life. And you're learning it now and it's gonna get reinforced in your time in the military. But take that into the workplace and it'll, it'll serve you well. So sir, they didn't teach you how to be a salesman in the SEAL community? They did not. That no. wasn't, okay. Well, we used to go give these briefs to admirals about how we wanna go bomb this and kill that. And that, they, they always made them nervous. Translate? No, okay. it wasn't the same. <laughs> I learned not to cuss in the civilian world. That was an important yeah. lesson. You can't tell people in a meeting to F off. I learned that my second month on the job. <laughs> when you're a 200 pound guy that just got out of the SEAL teams and um, then you tell someone to shut the F up in a meeting, that doesn't, that don't do that. There's a lot of things you learn. Yeah. <laughs> I've come a long ways. That was 20 years ago, I promise. <laughs> Um, I want to address this next question, anyone in particular, but as military leaders, how can we best prepare our servicemen and women who are considering changing or about to change their careers? You mean as in get out? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'll just reiterate what I said before, which is come up with a plan. Understand what you want to do, whether you want to go to school. I wound up doing the MBA thing a little bit later, but that's a great I've seen, a, I've seen a lot of success, especially the SEALs. For whatever reason, the SEALs all get into Warden and Harvard and stuff. I don't understand. But they all go to these really great schools, and then they come out of that with really great opportunities. So schools, you know, advancing your education on the way out is, like, a great, is a great idea. Um, but just, just have a plan. Know where you're going to go. Lay the network. I love it now when I start getting phone calls from, you know, captains and majors that are thinking about getting out and they start calling now like hey what are you up to what are you doing here's what I want to get into start building that work network now everybody's everyone's looking for good people everyone's looking for good people yeah I think one of the things for building your network too is you know if there's something you're interested in it doesn't have to mean you know if you decide you go to a meeting for an industry group and you don't like it fine you reserve the right to change and look at something else I think industry groups can be a really low entry point low barrier fairly affordable to learn more about an industry or more about a segment or even more about a company that you're interested in. And on the networking piece, you know, use the tools that you have. So when you get to that point, LinkedIn is a fabulous tool for reaching out to people and sort of a cold call of like, hey, I'm really interested in XYZ. This is my background. Would you be interested in a coffee, either in person or a virtual coffee? And I always tell people like, it never hurts to ask. The worst they can say is no. And you would be amazed at how many people at you know, high levels like these gentlemen, gentlemen will return your calls and are happy to help either connect you to different people or really be that sponsor um, to help facilitate that transition. It's a really good question because uh, you're all going to, it's a two-part question. One is for yourselves when you get out of the military. The other part of it is you're going to have a team, whatever size, platoon, company, depending on what size group you have. And they're, it's transient, right? They're coming and going out of the military. That's just normal. Um, first thing I'd say is when somebody comes to you and tells you they're getting out of the military, don't tell them they're a dirtbag and they're a traitor and they're leaving, turning their back. That's, I learned that lesson a long time ago, and I've never done that to people. People's lives change, circumstances change, have respect for them. Um, and, and in fact, I got out of active duty and did not stay in the reserves because of the individual who did that. You know, I got back in. I, the grudge went away, and I got back in on active duty later and went to Iraq. But still, um, don't treat people that way is, would be the first piece of advice I'd give you. But secondly, your um, airmen, sailors, um, infantrymen, whoever, um, they're going to be getting out of the military at some point. And you got to help them because you want them to be successful in the rest of their lives, right? Because you care about them, hopefully. And uh, it's hard. I, I spend a lot of time and have for years on helping veterans get into AT&T. And we hire thousands of veterans every year. And the biggest challenge that I see is they have a really hard time relating what they did in the military to civilian, especially on a resume. They'll write a resume with a bunch of acronyms and numbers and commands and nobody in the civilian world understands that. And I always start with, I read your resume, it looks really good, I don't understand half of what's on it. And I came from the military. 
and they immediately get the point, like, okay, I need to dumb this down, not dumb it down, but I need to make it so that it's legible for somebody in the civilian world. And help, so help your, help your enlisted folks, help your fellow officers, junior, that'll be junior to you someday, help them figure out how to speak the, uh, the civilian language and, and find themselves jobs out in the civilian world, because they're an asset to society. And the more, as I tell people at AT&T, and obviously I'm biased and I have to be careful but I tell people the more military folks we can hire into our company, the better off our company is going to be. Whether they're officers, enlisted, doesn't matter um, because it's a great community of people. Sir, I think you made a, one point that needs a foot stomp because you guys are leaders, whether you're mids that are going to be future officers or, or the senior folks in here that already are leaders. There's, there's the point about taking care of your employees and knowing that they're going to grow and move on is so important. That will come back to hurt you if you burn those bridges. When someone wants to leave your outfit and move on to something, you should want your employees to grow in advance. You should want your partners to find new opportunities and go chase them. That stuff will come back and help you if you foster it and if you, if you help it. And I, and I think that that's, that deserves a foot stomp, that if you have people that are working for you, one, you won't be surprised when they leave because you've opened the door and said, hey, if you ever have something you want to go do, come tell me. So you won't get that surprise. And two, it's going to come back around and help you because they're going to go somewhere. They're going to be successful because you let them do that. And then somehow that relationship is going to come back to help you. So that's an important point that, that you made there. Thanks, man. Sure. Hey, Marines and Navy do get along. How about that? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. <laughs> um, to kind of flip the previous question a little bit, how can you, now that you're on the civilian side, have an outside view on helping veterans that might have just gotten out? How can they be helped in the private sector? So I, I just studied this, so I, I don't know if these things are good or not because I haven't used them, but there are some great programs out there. I want to bring in a couple more people. So I've learned about SkillsBridge. I've learned about the other VA opportunities that are out there. So there are pipelines that the government supports like this SkillsBridge program what, that can get you opportunities to work for companies um, that could turn into full-blown careers. Uh, that and also what you mentioned about resumes and translating your military career into the civilian career. Um, one of my classmates, a guy named Brian Stan, was a longtime CEO of a company called Hire Heroes, and I know they're not the only ones, but Hire Heroes is an outfit that will take your resume and translate it into civilian terms. You know, company is a, you know, this guy held a budget of $2 million and, and bought this and that and, and carried out these type of tasks. And those things will be translated into civilian terms, which will really help with the hiring process. So companies like Hire Heroes, programs like SkillsBridge, they exist. I would encourage anyone who's thinking about transitioning or if you have people that are thinking about transitioning, look, look them up. You know, it's just Google. Yeah, I think a huge part that we don't talk about enough is navigating the ambiguity, right? So you're sort of at the choose your own journey once you go to the civilian side. And, you know, as a leader in an organization, you have the responsibility for those coming in to help facilitate their transition. And I think one of the best things that the military provides is this really strong sense of family, right? Family, tribe, team. And when you go to a big company or even a small one, that might not be there. And so for those who are hiring veterans in, we have a duty to ensure that we're providing that same type of family and that those who are coming in understand you know, where they can turn to for different resources. How do medical benefits work, right? Medical benefits are totally different than TRICARE. What is a 401k? Like some of what we think are maybe basic skills on the civilian side and having your HR teams spending time so that they're making sure that the most fundamentals from day one of when that person comes in, they don't have to worry about because they're usually coming with a family alongside with them. Nothing to add. You did a good job. Don't balk at that reserve career, by the way. TRICARE is worth its weight in gold, especially if you want to be a small business owner. You know, I started a company, and I didn't have to worry about health care because I'm a reserve Marine. I mean, that is just like you don't know how valuable that is. So consider the reserve career. Don't, don't just don't throw it out. Sir, speaking on that, could you talk on, like, how you the process to start your own business and some of the unexpected things that might have happened? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was, um, I'll say this, uh, starting my own business, I was scared to do it. I was, I was afraid. I didn't want to do it. I, I was like, I have three kids already. Um, I have a mortgage. My, my 
my family is you know at risk if I try to jump out and start my own company. Um, but my wife really encouraged me. The MBA program I went to encouraged me. You know, I left that MBA every day thinking that it's not that hard to start a company. It's not that hard to start a company. I am smart enough. You know, a lot of times, you know, you kind of don't know if your idea is a good idea or not, you know. Um, but it's worth a shot. It's worth a shot. And I would say that there's a lot of support networks. I was in the reserve, so I don't have to worry about, about health care. I went to, I mean, about, um, yeah, benefits. I went to my current employer, and I just, I was honest. And I said, hey, I think there's an opportunity for me to do this out here in the, in the um, as, as my own company, as a veteran-owned business. I think there could be some great relationships that we, I could build back with you later on. And I had a boss that, that was like, you know, um, what Chris had said before about taking care of your employees and allowing them to grow. And he was great. And, and they were like, hey, how can we help? We're into that. We think this will come back and pay us dividends in the back end, and it has for them. So that, that moment was scary. I went in there to tell them I'm going to leave. I'm going to go start my own company. But I left that office knowing that I had the support of my wife, my family, my, my former employer. Um, and then all I, just, all I had to do was really go get that first client. And that just takes work. Um, so once you have that going and you get your first client, then you, you roll that into your second and things start going. And I would say, I guess what I'm getting at is that, that the biggest thing to overcome is the fear. The biggest thing to overcome is the fear. And I think what I never really thought about was if I fail, it's not, I'm not falling into a black hole never to be seen again. You know, I go get another job somewhere. I'll, I'll call one of these guys, Naval Academy grads, and can I come work for AT&T? You know, you guys are going to have a great network out there. So don't be afraid to take the shot. I probably should have done it two years earlier, but I was scared. I was scared. I was more scared to do that than to go on a patrol with, with Marines, you know, and, and I feel like that's, that held me back, and, and I probably should have been, I should have just taken that shot a little sooner. I'm glad I did it. It's going well. Um, there's definitely times when, you know, it's, it's a little scary. Got to pay a lot of people, take care of people. There's a lot of families that I have to worry about. Um, not, not that many. It's not a huge company, but it's still, it's more than just my own, you know. So I would just, I would say it's probably the fear thing. Getting over that fear is probably the, probably the number one thing. And you guys can all do it. You guys are all better than me, I guarantee it. Anybody here at Naval Academy now, you, you're better than me. First of all, you signed up knowing that you could go to war. When I signed up, there was no wars going on. Um, so I know that you're braver than me already. So I guess that's it. Thank you. Um, and to open up just a little bit more, I'm, as we heard in the last panel, everyone goes through failures. It's part of our lives. Would you be able to touch on any of the business failures or career failures that you may have faced, big or small? You first. Boy, you first. oh, the list, the list. Um, the, the, the midshipman who picked me up and brought me here from the airport I don't know if he's in the audience. Um, he was prior enlisted. He was saying it's um, at the academy. I have to be careful sometimes what I say. It's a little bit more of a proper environment. Does that make sense? Um, it does. I was here once. It's true. Um, well, well, a corporate America is like that times ten. Um, and so, uh, honestly, that's been my that has been the failure that has gotten me in trouble the most. It seems immature and silly. But uh, saying what I think when I think it is something that I've just always done. But that can get you in trouble sometimes. You've got to back up, think a little bit. Think about who you're talking to. Consider the broad range of people that you're talking to. In the military, it's a bit more of a homogenous environment relative to the civilian world where you have a very disparate group of people. And that's been something that I have struggled with for years. And you know, you made the point about imposter syndrome. Like, I have a hard time recognizing the fact that when I get on a call to talk to my team, I've got thousands of people out there, and they're paying attention to what I say, and so I can't just say whatever I think, however I want to say it. I've got to be a little bit more careful, and I don't have to be the, the business, polite talk, you know, professional speaker, but I do need to be a bit more careful. And so I, I could tell stories, I won't bore you, but um, stepping in it multiple times, just saying what I think and not being careful enough and getting called into human resources and having them talk to me, 
that's intimidating and, and frustrating. And I'm pretty senior at AT&T. I run the global network, yet two months ago I was in the HR's office again. And <laughs> Sounds like you're still working through it. I'm still bit. working through yeah. it, man. I'm almost 50. <laughs> you're all like, who invited this clown? But it's just, it's the reality of who people are. We all have our flaws. And she sat me down and she says, you know, you said this. It wasn't catastrophic, but maybe you could have said it differently. I said, that's a good point. Thanks for the help. You know? You're working on it. But it was a failure, let's be honest. But you just got to keep going. It's not that big of a deal. We all make failures like that along the way. But you just got to pick up and keep going. And Lord knows that's what we learn here, right? You go to a military institution, and that's what you learn. You learn how to fail repeatedly and get up and keep going. That'll serve you for the rest of your life for sure. Oh, my. You're looking at me. Uh. <laughs> I keep going first. I'm, like, I'm going last. So this isn't one I would think of. I mean, it's, if we're talking business failures, bad decisions, strategy, people, should I have let that person go sooner than I did? How could I have handled that situation? But actually talking to this group, and this one's maybe a little bit harder to sort of correlate properly, um, but I had been out for six years or so. And so again, I wasn't commissioned for very long, but sort of the culture of the Navy had really stuck with me. And I went to Holland America Group, and I was supporting our executive team for four cruise lines, so uh, over 40 vessels plus six new builds at any given time. And our EVP, executive vice president, was a retired admiral, and then one of our SVPs was a retired admiral, and one of our uh, other SVPs was an 06. And so for me, I was sort of like, holy, and I get in trouble a lot for speaking too, but... Uh, <laughs> with them, everything was sir. And I, even though it had been years, I fell back into sort of the military hierarchy. And because I was young, I felt so much uh, respect for them. And a lot of times I would realize that I was holding back in situations where, you know, my boss, who was not much older than me, would just walk up to him and be like, hey, Bob. And I'm like, oh, my God, you just called the Admiral Bob. You do not do that. You never, never do that. And what it took me quite a few months and probably even a year to realize is I was imposing these own self-inflicted rules on myself that no one else was playing by the same rule book. And I think it's incredibly important to respect those who serve and incredibly important to respect our leaders. But the culture coming into that environment was very different than what I'd had in the military and even what I'd had at other companies. And so for what I hadn't quite realized was that I had a place at the table and I wasn't owning up to that place at the table because I was too focused probably on the decorum. And so I think that's one thing for anyone transitioning out of the military. If you're going into defense or going to work for the primes, you know, the military culture sticks a little bit more. If you're going into tech, you can throw that out the door. It's always important to be kind and ethical, but, you know, you might have someone who's 21 and straight out of school that's running a massive team because they're, you know, just a total genius. So for me, that's been a really big lesson that I carry because in the role that I have today, I'm now engaging with gentlemen like this. I'm like, I have no business sharing the same stage as you. And yet I serve my company to make sure that I am representing our interests in the best way possible for both our business and our customers. By the way, I, I'm going to give you my resume. I want you to hire me because <laughs> you definitely deserve it. So um, I, guess, I guess what I would say is when I, when I transitioned out, I think the two biggest things I learned right away was one, People are not early. <laughs> I would be sitting in meetings, you know, 15 minutes early. <laughs> <laughs> They're barely on time. Yeah. 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 God, so, that was so, frustrating, wasn't right? it? It I mean, still frustrates me. Running yeah. late and they're holding their Starbucks. Dang. Like, ah. Oh, yeah. I'm late and I have a coffee. I'm the late. meeting didn't start at 103, yeah. people. It started at 1. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so it took me a long time <laughs> and a lot of sitting alone in conference rooms to realize that, you know, that I'm <laughs> not going to be, uh, doesn't, early is different in the military. But the other thing was that you all, if you're not already, when you get out to the military, you will be fire and forget weapons. People will tell you to do something and you will go get it done. And I know that in the Marine Corps, especially, you know, I could tell a corporal, hey, corporal, go get, go get a Super Bowl for the Eagles. And he'd probably come back in a little bit and be like, sorry, the Eagles won the Super Bowl. I'd be like, great, awesome. <laughs> Which they're gonna do this year, by the way. But <laughs> our, our sailors, Marines, airmen, Soldiers, they are fire and forget weapons. Most of them, you can just tell them to do a task and they will go do it. And in the civilian world, there's a lot more follow-up required. So when you come out, you will be special because you'll be a fire and forget. Your managers and your senior folks will want you to do the job. But the folks that you task and the subcontractors you hire and the consultants you hire, you gotta be very careful about following up and checking up. And, and that bit me because I was new, I was young, I got out, I was like, hey, 
guys, go do this thing and, uh, and knock it out. And they, they came back, you know, my, my supervisors come back to me and say, how's it going? I said, you know what, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't heard from that guy in a while, you know? Bad move, because guess what? It wasn't going. Another one going anyway. Um, and so it's on me. And by the way, great book. If you haven't read it, there's a book called Extreme Ownership written by one of these guys. Um, and it just talks about how when that happens, that's not their fault. It's not on them. That was on me. That was on me because I forgot to follow up. I forgot to follow through. I thought it was going to be Message Garcia and get done. Message Garcia doesn't exist out there. It exists only in here. All right. So I would say that was my biggest lesson learned. It bit me, um, cost my company some money. I got some bad paper. It wasn't great. And it was because a task went undone because I, I made the assumption that it was happening. Can I just add one thing to that? So I think on the opposite of that, for all of you who are fire and forget and just get stuff done, a really good way I heard this put, and especially for women, is the tendency to take on too much. So it's Dory principle, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, right? Like we take on more and more, and you're sort of a Christmas tree with all of the ornaments. And in the civilian world, your managers don't necessarily realize everything that they're hanging on you or asking of you because you're just the person who always gets it done. And so a lot of times it's being able to be firm enough to know when to say, no, I think I'm at my limit or this is, you know, my work-life balance or whatever I'm doing to protect to ensure that the things that are really important that you've asked me to deliver on, I can. Yeah. I just want to say I'm a little upset. Message to Garcia doesn't really apply. <laughs> oh, it, it applies in the military. Okay, perfect. Go get that message to him. You don't, you, but, don't get, you don't get a break. I'm just saying out there in the world, you got to be careful. Awesome. Um, so now we're going to invite questions from any of the audience members. Please step up to the mic and be very loud if you're in the stands above. Hi, everybody. and Thank you so much for taking the time to be up here and speak. And all of you are very much deserving of your spot up there. Uh, I'm Mitchum in third class, Elise Chaffin. Um, my question for you are maybe um, focusing more on the mental challenges that you faced personally within your individual selves uh, as you were transitioning out of the military. I know that, um, sir, you spoke a little bit on deciding to go back and kind of uh, just dealing with that entirely different mindset. Thank you. Yeah, I'll start. The biggest struggle for me was I wasn't, it, I wasn't serving anymore. That was very hard. It's still hard for me today. Fortunately, at AT&T, um, I've kept some of the I'll call them qualifications I had in the military, so I still do government work within AT&T. So that's been very rewarding, thankfully. Um, but uh, the biggest struggle, you want to hear the chicken dance story? You do? OK. Yes. The chicken dance story. So I got out, and um, the last thing I did before we got out, a week, about a week, week and a half before we actually flew back, we were boarding um, Iraqi ships that were running the embargo in the middle of the night. So we were doing ship boardings and taking down uh, Iraqi tankers. And um, then we got back, we got out of the military, both Jeff and I did, and then we ended up in business school. The time from when we boarded the last ship to when I was in business school, maybe three weeks. Okay, so that's kind of a hard transition, um, running around with guns on a ship to you're sitting in a business school class. So business school starts, and the first day was an orientation it's about 300 students in the class. I went to USC out in California, and, it, and it's, so it's beautiful outside. So they said, let's all go outside. We're all going to get to know each other. First activity, we're going to do a chicken dance. And so I'm like, we're not really doing the chicken dance. So sure enough, there's two lines of 150 people doing the chicken dance. And I'm sitting here. I'm not doing the chicken dance. I'm just standing there thinking, what the F have I gotten myself into? I was bored in ships with my buddies, and I'm doing the chicken dance. And I'm looking up and down the line, and <laughs> behind me, about 50 people back, there's another guy, and he's just standing here like this. <laughs> and he's not doing the chicken dance either. Turns out he was the other military guy in the class. He was a SEAL also. <laughs> and afterwards, I went up and shook his hand, and I said, what did you do in the military? He goes, how did you know I was in the military? I just had a feeling. He's like, I was a SEAL anyways. It was a funny story. But that was my introduction to the civilian world. That was hard. Then I spent the next two years in, a, in my shell, really not getting to know people, which I don't recommend. Um, but then going into the civilian world, I mean, he said it. It's people doing what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it, the way they said that they were going to do it. Not the way, not, notice I didn't say the way I told them to do it, just 
do what you're supposed to do. It's a basic, basic thing in the military. Um, because if you don't do it in the military, whether it's war or peacetime, people are going to get hurt or people are going to die. So that's just kind of the expectation I had. But then you learn, okay, you, you, people are either in one of two camps. They're in the Message to Garcia camp where you can ask them to do something and they'll just do it and get it done. And then there's the people who aren't. And early on in my career, that was about 50-50. And I, you learn how to follow up with people. And, you know, we're disciplined and motivated so we can follow up with people really well. And we're good at that. Um, but that was my biggest struggle. And then, of course, just I wasn't serving anymore, so how am I going to serve? So I ended up getting back in the reserves and serving that way. But it's hard when you get out. It's hard. Yeah, I would say mental, mental health-wise, um, I definitely, I, I, when I was a young lieutenant captain, I was in the camp of these people are all just weak. They, they're, they're such babies, everyone. And I learned over time that, 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 that it's a real thing. And I spent a lot of time thinking about my friends, J.P. Blacksmith, Ron Winchester, Travis Manion, Brennan Looney, Doug Zembeck, these legends. And I pray to God you guys do not go through the time that we went through and lose as many friends as we have. But there's times when I'm just like, why am I even working? Like, I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be doing any of this. I, I, I'm, I'm so blessed and I'm so fortunate. But that's where you find ways to serve. Volunteer for things, coach Little League, do do things in life that will remind you that work is not the most important thing and, and you can carry on the legacy of the fallen. It's important to your mental health. Amen. Say that. I think there's a, a few ways to make sure you're sort of spending time in your own head and whether that's you know right now going through university or the academy or once you're in the military or you know in exec. Um, but for me, a few years ago, I heard on a podcast, and it sounds really stupid, but it's called a personal inventory day. And for me, this is something that I've made part of just my monthly habits. It doesn't matter what is on my calendar. I will block out two hours a month to go to a coffee shop I've probably never been to, turn my phones off, and just sit in my own head. Because that's something that we usually don't have enough time to do. We're just running from one thing to another and not ever really having a chance to process those emotions. I heard Sheryl Sandberg speak a few years ago about we take on the next derivative of our feelings, meaning I'm frustrated, I'm frustrated, or I'm angry, I'm angry. And so for me, having this chance of you know an hour or two to reflect, I start with, first and foremost, what am I grateful for? Which is usually my husband and son and my family and my team. And going from there, sort of, what were the three things I was proud of this month? What were the things that didn't go as planned? And sort of just going through these different questions to really help me process what has happened in a time when I haven't had a chance to just sort of step away. And it's amazing when you go back a couple of hours later or a month or a year later, by the way, it's great for writing a fit rep or a performance review because you've helped capture what you're proud of and the things that you might have wanted to course correct all, along the way. But the other thing for myself that's been really important is having your rituals in place, right? Like I think a lot about how do we get on the flywheel? How do you get into the mental state where you can continue to do something without sort of falling off? And so for me, you know, it's setting those rituals in place, whether that's working out or you know, small things like I carry the same exact type of tea in the same pocket when I travel so that I always have those things I can fall back to when whatever inevitably is going to pop up happens, there are some constants in my life that I know I can rely on. Right over here. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am and gentlemen. Uh, this has been really awesome to hear about like what's potentially in our future. Uh, as midshipmen, we have like, we want a temporary transition to the civilian life with internships over the summer but we're kind of in, like, in a hard place where we don't have that military experience or it feels like we don't really have that network. Do you have any suggestions for how we can kind of get our way into the door of internships? I don't know the answer to that. Call at and <laughs> <laughs> We were just talking about this beforehand, and we, we do internships, but uh, it's very small, and I've been, I, I didn't even know about it, so I'm going to work on getting that expanded, and I will. But... Don't sell yourself short. I don't want, don't get big heads or anything. Remember I said earlier, people are watching you, or people will be watching you. Well, they're watching you now. The people you went to high school with, um, you're at one of the most elite institutions in America, bar none. Um, and they're, your friends in high school are watching you. Um, people out in corporate America, they know that this is one of the top institutions in the country, not just for academics, but for leadership and all of the hardships that you go through and survive, right? So. Don't sell yourself short. It's not an easy thing, but it all gets back to networking. One is you have people at the Naval Academy, the foundation, um, and the Alumni Association that are working on helping you guys get internships, but you can also do it by networking. 
So we were talking to someone earlier about LinkedIn. If you're not on LinkedIn, which you're probably not, I mean, it's a business, uh, a business networking tool. Um, but get on LinkedIn, set yourself up a profile. It's basically, if you're not familiar, it's social media for business. Um, get yourself a LinkedIn profile and start pinging business leaders like, hey, I'd like to do an internship at the cybersecurity group at AT&T. Find some people with that title <clears throat> and send them notes on LinkedIn. You'd be surprised. Um, you can find anybody on that, on LinkedIn, anybody in the business world. So that's one suggestion. But networking is going to get you everywhere in life. It really is. Could you also introduce yourself, but right over here, please? Sorry. Um, good afternoon. My name is Ben Both. I am a uh, second year transfer student at the California State University Maritime Academy. I am a marine transportation major. Um, my question for you all is one that I've been pondering um, as of late as the university considers the future of its regiment. Um, how do you get others to understand that living a regimental way of life is applicable to the commercial world, and is it really? So thank you for your time. I would, I would give you a quick answer on that, yeah. So if you wake up early, you make your bed, you're squared away, you show up on time, and you do your job, you go home at night, you rest, relax, have a beer, take, read your kids, and that's just going to make you, if you live that kind of regimented lifestyle with the occasional, I'm um, just going to blow today off and go have some fun, you know, you're gonna just be a more well-rounded person and that's gonna, that's gonna translate to doing tasks. And I feel like corporate America knows that and wants those people. And I don't think you, we have to convince anyone of that. I think people know that. Um, that's my take. Yeah, I mean, it's for, so for Cal Maritime, for me coming from the commercial maritime world, when we see people with the regiment type experience or academy experience, it is an immediate check in the box. I have an immediate understanding of what you've been through and what your willingness to do hard work is or your capabilities you know, up to a certain point, which is very different than when we vet other candidates who might be fantastic, but it requires a lot more to understand sort of what's their base level of what they're able to accomplish. If you do the things that they said, you're ahead of 90% of the population, period. And most business leaders know that. So yeah, absolutely, it's worth it. You're doing the right thing. Thank you. Absolutely. Left side, please. Hi, I'm a business leader looking for a, for a team that's 90% or higher. Mm -hmm. uh, my name's Trisha DeMarco, and I'm here with my team from Spalding D. Decker. And my question is, as a company that's looking to hire and recruit veterans and bring, uh, bring veterans into our staff, what support services should we be implementing in our HR um, to attract and provide the wraparound support that you'll need, um, veterans will need as they transition into our company, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah. Do you have a veteran doing your hiring? Mm, no, but we, we have veterans represented on our team. Okay. So I would start with, because I just fought this battle at AT&T, we had a veteran doing, doing the veteran recruiting and then they changed jobs and they decided they weren't going to backfill and they were just going to have someone with a civilian background doing all the veteran hiring, which I don't know nothing against civilians, but they can't read a resume. They don't, and it's just not their fault. They just don't understand what's on that resume and they don't necessarily know how to communicate. And so there's a woman at AT&T, a Marine, got her back in the job. She did it before. She's phenomenal. Very good friend of mine. And um, to me, that was the first step. There's a bunch of programs, he mentioned them. That's good also, just shadowing and mentorship programs. But the more you get the employees within the company exposed to military folks, um, the easier it'll be, because they'll start wanting to hire them. They'll start wanting to hire more of them. And then the second thing, which has been very important for us, is give them a, a buddy when they get hired on. The, um, the transiency or the, 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 the rate at which veterans get hired into a job and then switch jobs, you probably know it's very high within the first year or two. They don't typically stay at their first job, and a lot of that is because they get in there. Um, someone tells them they got to go do the chicken dance. They're like, what the heck have I done coming here? Um, not literally, but figuratively do the chicken dance. And they need someone to be a mentor to help them out and show them the ropes at the company. So that's a really important, whether that person's a veteran or not, doesn't necessarily matter. But just somebody they can pick up the phone and call. And these days in corporate America, not everybody's at the headquarters location, at the office. Some of them are working from home. That makes it even harder, right? 
you're a veteran that comes into a company, you don't see people every day, you work from home a lot, you don't really have anybody to call to help you with stuff. After a while, you think, forget it, I'm going to go somewhere else and try again. So hopefully that helps. I mean, I'm going to go off the cuff on this because I haven't done this and I don't know that it exists, but when I saw your resume, what, what do you do with the Medal of Honor Foundation? I'm on the board of directors. All right, so, but, but you have I another... I try and raise money, basically. Okay, all right. So uh, here's, here's a suggestion for civilian companies, and maybe I'll even do this with my own. Um, if you're going to have veterans on your team, tie your organization to some service organization and yeah. make it their collateral duty to be a part of that and make it important because... What I talked about with, you know, I don't think you need to have, like, therapists on your staff and people to, like, hug people. No. But. <laughs> Spoken like a true Marine. Yeah. <laughs> but I happen to agree with him, but. <clears throat> yeah. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a terrible idea for you to be connected to a service organization and say, hey, look it, in your 40-hour week, I want you to have an hour or two dedicated to this. And, you know, that means that on our dime, you can be out there volunteering for them for, you know, half a day or something. I think that would, that would be a huge benefit to a veteran working for a civilian company. Yeah, our company is just going through this because, like I said, we're primarily Norwegian and we're significantly growing our office here. So when I came in, one of the things I realized was that our reserve policy was unwritten. It existed, um, but that delta to capture, you know, when you go on reserve duty, your salary is probably less in the reserves than in your civilian job. And so for us, it was really important to tell our team, hey, we're either going to make up that delta and or continue paying you the same so that you can go and do your reserve duty. Because it's really important to us as a company that you get to fulfill that you know, personal obligation and personal goals that you have. Um, and I, I think the other part as well, and this ties into just your entire company, is looking at what's your family leave policies. There's a lot of people who clearly have families while they're in the military, but for those who have waited until they got out, it's a huge security net to be able to offer, you know, 12 weeks or whatever it might be beyond. And in those types of policies, making it really clear that this is not just for women, this is family, this is for adoption, this is for if you give birth yourself, but also having bereavement. And for people in the military, never knowing what's going to come or, you know, who they might lose, bereavement for miscarriage, all of those factors, hopefully that's something that you don't have to leverage, but it's really nice to be able to tell someone coming in that that option is going to be there for them if they need it. Thank you. We have time for one more question, please. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. My name is Gabriella Gibson. I'm a sophomore at the Wharton School. And something we talk about a lot there is the knowing when to grit and knowing when to quit. So basically acknowledging when it might be time to consider a new path, um, which can be especially hard like, given that a lot of people have type A personalities. So I was wondering, when you all were transitioning from military service to the business world, what were your considerations going into that? And is there anything that you wish you would have considered earlier? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I wish I would have figured out what I wanted to do in the civilian world, <clears throat> which sounds silly, but I really didn't know. But then on the other hand, uh, I took a leap and went back to business school to try and figure it out. So going back, I probably wouldn't have done anything differently necessarily, but I didn't have a plan. And that was part of my message earlier, is you don't always have to have a plan. We're all type A's. We like to have a plan. We like to know exactly where we're going, where we're going there, and how long it's going to take to get there. But um, it doesn't always work that way in life, unfortunately. So sometimes you just got to fall back on the fact that you're flexible and resilient and go for it. I think what we learned in the speech earlier is probably where I would start. I would just say, figure out what's the most important thing. Right? What's, what's that? What is it? The goal? Or, I can't believe I already drew a blank on it. That's right. Your purpose, right? What's your purpose? And, and if it's the big things in life are family right, and the legacy that you're going to leave and what, what your personal honor is, right, so make changes that, make changes that work for that, you know, don't make changes because it's hard or because it's tough or things, things aren't going the way that you want them to go, make changes in the direction of, of that, and I think that speech you got today earlier is probably that, and I, and I think I would have, I would say, I think that's why, I, you know, I decided that a kid and a marriage and those things more important than an active duty career, but I could find other ways to achieve my purpose, you know? So I equated grit to, I love Angela Duckworth's definition, which is stick to so this morning's session was great. Um, but for a long time, I equated the opposite of grit as failure, because the opposite of not sticking to it was failing, deciding to step away. And it took me a long time to get to the point to realize that for me, sort of the difference between grit 
um, sort of giving up and failure was, you know, think about how out of sync your values are when you're doing something that you really don't identify with. And the idea to continue going along with something just because, oh, I've got to stick to it, I've got to keep going, that doesn't serve anyone, and it certainly doesn't serve yourself. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you all for the questions. Um, can we get a big round of applause for our panelists? They did an awesome job. And we also have a few good story. Thanks, everybody. Mm. Are you guys putting this on or what? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Shake your hands. You have one more round of applause for speakers. How are we doing? We still, we still in here? A little tired? No? Okay, good. All right, we're about to go on to another breakout session. First, we have our, one of our great senior staff members, Carol Schreier. Hey guys, I'm midshipman first class Carolyn Shire. I have a few transportation updates for our departure tomorrow for our external delegates who are flying out. So if you have a flight that requires transportation before our 10.20 a.m. scheduled transportation time, you should have received an email from me earlier today and you need a note.